I was actually trying to think of a um, a category so we could play the game because I was like, all the categories I can think of, she's going to do them real quick. <laughs> so you admit on camera you're making this way too hard for your I hope future guests are looking at this. And they are aware of the setup that you, the trap that you set for them. Let me share this. I'm still thinking of a category, but I'm going to share this. Um, let me see. Okay, I shared it to my profile. All right, you ready, Dr. McCray? We're going to. Um, since you admitted to trying to make it too hard for your guests, then the answer is a resounding no. <laughs> oh, okay. I know. I know. We're going to go in a different, um, we're going to go from a different perspective. So we're going to play my game. You played it before. Is Black Love. I got to open up my timer okay i got my timer i'm gonna give you category you got to name five things within 10 seconds in that category no ums us eyes no filler words okay your category since you are from the south this is easy five things that alabama is known for go um beaches you just said um oh, <laughs> I, I lost already <laughs> okay okay I give you a different category <laughs> all right i thought you were just going to I, I love no but i love i love filler words yeah something they they've been living with me since i can remember so i'm going to lose every time Filler words and noises. Okay, yeah. again, no ums. I like filler words too, but I'm not playing the game, so I'm just the host. I'm 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 like the Levar Burton of this <laughs> this live stream. <laughs> okay, we're gonna stay with Alabama. We're gonna stay with the South. Okay. Okay. I want you to name five foods that come from Alabama. Go. Alaga syrup, corn, okra, of course, pork, peach cobbler. Stop. You did it. Okay. You did it. Okay. What was the, the syrup? Say it again. Oh. <laughs> Alaga. You never heard of that before? No. I don't even know if it's really from Alabama or Georgia or both, but it's A L A G A. Um, syrup. That's what my uh, folks, my the elders in my community used to eat. I did not like it. Um, it is, uh, I think it's a um, uh, sorghum based, um. if I'm not mistaken. And um, let me see. I would love to know: Is it really from Alabama? Sorghum. Okay. And so, do they put it on biscuits, things like that? Right, yeah. So it says original cane flavored syrup, and you know me. I'm. I was. I was. Uh, you know, this was, I guess, when I became aware of it, the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So I, I was very much influenced by television. You know, the media, and I wanted my Mrs. Butterworths. <laughs> I couldn't get with the elders in their Alabama, Georgia syrup. Got it. Interesting. I've never heard of it. Is it Alagara syrup? A L A, mm -hmm. like Alabama. Uh -huh. G A, like Georgia. Alaga syrup. Alaga, yes. There it is. All right. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ife Tayo Ojolade, one of my good long-term friends that has been hanging with me for over 20 years now, is here to have a conversation today. This is Dr. Kendra McRae. She's a history professor. Thank you, Dr. McRae, for coming and hanging out with me. Oh, you're quite welcome. My pleasure. So we are going to be talking about 
Pan-Africanism. And we know that Marcus Garvey's birthday was a couple of days ago on the 17th, I believe. And so, and he's one of the, the big names that is known in the concept of Pan-Africanism. So I, I want us to just jump in and, and really kind of get from a historical perspective, because you always remind us to stay in our lane. <laughs> Because everybody think they're a historian because they don't read a book. And Dr. McCray helps us realize that there's actually a science to being a historian. So why don't you start out and just give us like a definition of what Pan-Africanism is? Okay, so that's a good question because so many people disagree with that or so many people have different viewpoints of what that is, you know, what Pan-Africanism is. And some people, there's so many definitions floating out there that some people decline to even define it. I felt Pan-Africanism, the definition was, I guess, obvious because coming to go to school at Spelman College in the West End, it seems as if Pan-Africanism is everywhere, right? Symbols of Pan-Africanism are everywhere from red, black, and green, or red, black, and green, red, black, green, and gold flags hanging on people's porches or in the fronts of their business, their storefronts, right? Um, the Shrine of the Black Madonna is in the West End, and, and they have their bookstore, and they have their, their galleries, and it's very Pan-Africanism and feel. So I thought Pan-Africanism, oh, look at it. Look at the word is self-explanatory, right? It's uh, all things Africanism. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so, but... um. And, and I have done uh, my master's thesis, had a Pan-Africanist perspective. My PhD dissertation dealt with Pan-Africanist groups. And I got, I talked to a, a, a professor at Spelman who's an Africanist. Mm -hmm. She asked me some hard questions about what Pan-Africanism is and what, what's going on with Pan-Africanism today. And I couldn't answer them. I was like, wait, hmm. I don't know anything about Pan-Africanism. <laughs> so, uh, Wait, what were the questions that she asked you that made mm -hmm. you realize that? Do you remember? Yeah, like what happened to Pan-Africanism after like 1990? Um, mm -hmm. What's going on with Pan-Africanism today? Is there a real Pan-Africanism movement today? Mm -hmm. um, how would you say these people who I feel you were discussing as sort of symbolically Pan-Africanist, what was the political manifestation of their work? What were some economic manif manifestations of their work? Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of questions. And right. um, those were harder questions for me to answer. And I don't feel, let me be clear, I did not observe that the people I studied were solely symbolically Pan-Africanist. Mm -hmm. But they were Pan-African cultural nationalists. So a lot of what they focused on was the, the way that people of African people and people of African descent have a common history, have a common struggle, and share, if we work together, a common destiny. So that's one definition, the belief that African people and people of African descent share a common heritage, share contemporary common struggles, and have a common destiny. That's one definition. Uh, other definitions that I have seen frame Pan-Africanism as both a philosophy and a set of movements, interlocking movements that are aimed toward the liberation, independence, sovereignty, and um, respect of African people worldwide. So African people on the continent and African people who are dispersed around the globe. Right. So those are two definitions that I've come across. How did you get into Pan-Africanism or like researching it? Mm, that's a good question. It was just something that became extremely interesting to me because I believe in my kindergarten to 12th grade schooling, 
when we had we had a lot of black history particularly because i went to uh initially a a a, a majority black school that was in my community the one that my mother went to when she was small so we had a lot of black history but at some point in high school i realized a lot of our black history started with chattel slavery it started with bondage and i wondered what went on before that these people had lives our ancestors had lives before Mm -hmm. chattel bondage and I just became extremely interested in answering that question and pan-africanists tended to deal with that question mm -hmm. so um I once I became interested in what pan-africanists were doing in a contemporary context I started thinking well what's the history of this pan-africanism thing and that's how I got interested huh okay I don't think I knew that. Really? No, no, I don't think we've ever talked about it. I just, wow. you know, when I met you, you just is, you know, the work that you did. So that's true. Yeah, because we met when I was a master's student. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But coming yeah. out of high school, I had a lot of questions and sought those answers in part through the, the my studies. Mm -hmm. And you said in your master's thesis that you um, partly focused on that. How did you do that? Like, what were you focused on? So what I focused on for my master's thesis was Oyotunji Village in South Carolina. I know you are familiar with Oyotunji Village. It was founded in 1970, uh, in particular under the leadership of Arefumi I and... Um, it It's in part an intended intentional community uh, and a, it's a religious it's an expression of religious nationalism but it also has political and economic components that i was interested in and i saw it as not just a manifestation of religious ideals but also of an embodiment of pan-africanism mm -hmm. so is pa what pan-africanism looks like among these people um in action okay. right. so i was thinking about what you said earlier is that you said you would use the term um cultural nationalist you said pan-africanist and you use the word cultural nationalism like so if it was my dad he would just you know, he would balk at the term cultural nationalism. And so I'm wondering if there's a difference, because I know in your dissertation work, you looked at folks that were um, cultural nationalists and looked at the Kawaita movement. Is there a difference between like terms like um, Black nationalism, cultural nationalism, Pan-Africanism that, I don't know, it just came to my head when you said, <laughs> like, are those different? So this is, I guess, our human tendency to categorize things and further categorize things and give them a name and describe them and parse through their meaning, right? So nationalism is the belief that a certain people, for whatever reason, be it language, um, uh, be it religion, form a nation. They constitute a nation. Mm -hmm. So that could mean that they 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 see themselves as a similar people, and they want to work toward having uh, a a nation as a nation state, as in a political entity with um, boundaries, mm -hmm. or it could mean that they feel like a nation. They, they're they similar. And one day they may want a nation, some people, but in the, some people may not envision a nation, but they might envision independent, strong institutions that serve this particular group who's distinct in certain ways from other groups. Does that make sense? It does, it does. 
Yeah. So black nationalism is a, based in race, right? So this idea that black people, however one might define blackness, constitute a nation. And in some, according to some definitions, black people in the United States constitute a captive nation within a nation, the oh, United yeah. States, right? And it's based, it's not a religious-based nationalism. It's not a, a language-based nationalism. It cuts across religion. It cuts across languages. It cuts across various ethnicities. Mm. There's this idea that African um, black people based on their race, constitute a nation. And so it's not only within, in terms of Pan-Africanism, it's not just people within the United States who believe that, but a Marcus Garvey who had traveled all over the world really, and definitely all over the Caribbean, Central and South America, and then into the United States, saw that everywhere he went, black people faced common struggles. Mm -hmm. And he was aware that they had, that we, that our ancestors had uh, common origins, common ancestry, and that we, if we work together, could achieve a common destiny of independence and that uh, there could be a, an independent black nation in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because what came to my mind is his moniker, um, one aim, one God, one destiny. Right. Um, and just looking at that kind of from a global movement, if we move forward and kind of think about, like, I want to go to this country and then move around. If we think about some of Garveyites in the South, can you tell me a little bit about the history of some of the people that were specifically part of Garvey's movement in the South? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because a lot of times, so Garvey co-founded with other people was the the leader of the universal negro improvement association unia mm -hmm. and i think probably a lot of your uh viewers and listeners will be familiar with that and a lot of times we think of the unia maybe we associate it with jamaica because garvey was jamaican mm -hmm. but its headquarters were in harlem new york yeah so a lot of times we think of in, I guess, the most specific sense as uh, the UNIA as a New York thing, but uh, uh, in a broader sense, the UNIA as a Northern urban thing. Mm -hmm. But I actually, I got my PhD from Georgia State, as you know, like mm -hmm. you did. And I was interested in going to Georgia State in, in part because they had a professor there who had done a, a book on Garvey and the Garveyite movement called Grassroots Garveyism. And her claim was that we associate Garveyism with these Northern urban settings, but that there were more UNIA um, um, chapters in the South. And so it, it, it had a vigorous following in southern states and um, among southerners. So for instance, Arkansas alone had in the 1920s 50 UNIA chapters, just the state of Arkansas. Is that where Malcolm's people were when his dad died? Where were they? Were they in Arkansas? They weren't, were in they, weren't they in Nebraska? Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. And that's totally me in terms of geography. Okay, don't okay. hold me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like I think I think if I remember correctly. correctly yeah, I think you're right. It's Nebraska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, uh, say for instance, um, there was when I was um, reading about women in the UNIA, there was a lady who became a a, a, um, a significant speaker in the UNIA. Her name was Laura Adakor Kofi, and she was actually originally from Ghana, mm -hmm. but she became a UNIA speaker, and she was so electrifying that she would attract many, 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 probably about a thousand new dues-paying members 
who would come to her speeches. And so I read that this this was also in the 1920s. Okay. And so um, I read about that and I was like, first of all, initially when I read about it, I stopped that she was from Ghana and she came (laughs) to the United States in the 1920s. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Like it's just not a common story that I've Mm -hmm. heard. So I put, put the information down and I went to research something else and I came back later and I was like, and these speeches she was giving were in the United States and in Central America. And that the a lot of the people were attracted to her speeches and the, a lot of the new members were drawn from places like Daphne, Alabama and West Palm Beach, Florida. Really? Yes. Not Just, New Alabama, but West Palm? Really? Yeah, yeah. Goodness. Yeah, West Palm Beach, Florida, Daphne, Alabama, places like that. So, yeah, the the uh, Dr. Rollinson at, at at Georgia State did a lot of work in showing like th- this was a part of the mass movement that was mm-hmm. the UNIA, and a lot of these people were Southerners. And you know, when you talk about Florida, um, eventually Laura Adekora Kofi got so popular that she, you know, Garvey didn't like that. She was expelled from the uh, UNIA. She went on to found her own church and then she was assassinated. She was killed um, possibly by a UNIA member, as I understand. Now, I I should have given a caveat. I'm not a Garveyite scholar. I'm not (laughs) a UNIA scholar. Right, but now you know, you done told us all kinds of stuff. I ain't never heard nothing. (laughs) Yes, go look at the work of um, Keisha Blaine, Natanya Duncan. They really chronicled these women's lives very closely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you, we should all, if we're interested in Garvey and Garvey's legacy, be interested in those women's work. I'm putting them down. I did Dr. Rollinson's um, mm-hmm. book. I put that in there already. Okay. Yep. And so Keisha uh, N. Blaine. B-L-A-I-N. Do you know, did she write a book or is it mm-hmm. journal? She, she wrote a book uh, called Set the World on Fire. Okay. And uh, Natanya Duncan. Okay, I'm gonna put them both in there. Mm-hmm. And she she does mostly journal articles, I, and um she has a, a dissertation out there. Uh, and her uh, Natanya Duncan, and she has a speech. I hope it's going to be available to the public. Uh, on Garvey's birthday, she did give a speech um, at Liberty Hall in Jamaica about uh, Garveyite women and their legacies, and um, it was really good. So uh, I was watching it on YouTube, and if I if it comes up that it's available, I will definitely share it. Okay. Yeah, I'm putting Keisha Blaine in um, right now. And tell me the second person again. Natanya N A T A N Y A Duncan. Okay. And does she? Do you know the name of her book? She um, has journal articles, okay. and um, her her dissertation is about if she labels. Garveyite women, efficient women, efficient women. She okay. said that they, they, that's how they might have labeled themselves. Okay, interesting. So I, what I found was interesting is I went to Panama. The first time I went to Panama, I went to the museum there. The, so they have a museum. This Panama has a very interesting history because they have like people of African descent from the, the Spanish invasions but then also as a result of lots of folks from the caribbean as a result of building the panama canal that was built by halliburton most people don't know that so remember halliburton from iraq Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the one of the things that i found was interesting in this little museum that's talking about people of african descent in panama is that there were so many garveyites in panama yes I was so impressed by that. <laughs> Absolutely. And you sound like me when I took a class. I audited a class at Georgia State that was on the something about Latin America. Mm-hmm. And for my final project, I wanted to look at the Garveyite movement in Latin America. And it just blew my mind. One, <laughs> that there was there were Spanish pages and french pages in the negro world 
uh, mm-hmm. newspaper that was produced by the UNIA mm-hmm. that my Spanish was not nearly strong enough to really understand mm-hmm. the level of sophistication in terms of the conversations they were having in the mm-hmm. in the Negro world in Spanish and how there were all these UNIA chapters in the Spanish speaking world and Cuba had one and and mm-hmm. places where they couldn't really talk about put their race out front and have a kind of race first set of values mm-hmm. they would do interesting things to morph and say this is you know this is also about you know this kind of value or that kind of value not necessarily just about negro improvement right like the universal improvement association drop negro that kind of thing very interesting mm-hmm. and there were chapters so, you, you know, we're talking about the North, we're talking about the South, we're talking about Central America. Um, there were chapters in South America. There were chapters in the Midwest. So once Garvey was convicted of fraud and spent time here in Atlanta in the penitentiary in the 1920s, and then his sentence was commuted by Calvin Coolidge President Calvin Coolidge, but he was deported. Mm-hmm. And so the the UNIA started to fall in disarray. There was some infighting. Uh, but as at I think around 1940, the headquarters moved were moved from Harlem to Cleveland. So Keisha Blaine points out uh, in her work, in her speeches a lot, that we think about the North, and I might say we started have started a conversation about the UNIA in the South, but we don't think about the UNIA in the Midwest. Mm-mm. But, you know, maybe if you go back and read Malcolm X's influences through his mom, Louise Little, you'll see, wait, there was a Garveyite thing going on in the Midwest too, right? Mm-hmm. So it was all over. And uh, we talked about Ghana, um, uh, Adakor Kofi, but there were actual UNIA um, um uh, um, chapters in Ghana, in South Africa, yeah, all over. In Ghana too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. So that's Pan African. That's also Pan Africanism in in action. So how does I, I think when at least when I think about it? Because again, I'm not a historian. I think of Garvey as the kind of the initiator of Pan Africanism. Is that correct? Or how does he? How is he associated with the concept of Pan Africanism? Because I see those two things as linked. Oh wow! Yeah, so they are linked, but he's not definitely not the initiator of Pan Africanism. Okay. So depending on whose work you read, Pan Africanism, the roots of Pan Africanism, let's just say the 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 antecedents of Pan Africanism can be placed in uh, something uh, like some people would say in the hold of the slave ships in the hold of the ships that our enslaved ancestors were packed in as cargo so uh, people might um, cite a Michael Gomez's book and saying once those our ancestors exchanged their country marks the ones that would have identified the people they came from in West and Central Africa for a different identity once they saw that everybody in the hold of the ship looked like them, no matter whether if they were Ibibio or Igbo or Yoruba or Hausa or what have you, um, that they they were in a similar situation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so they were different people at that point. People say the roots of the ideology of Pan-Africanism were forming there Mm -hmm. so it wasn't a coherent movement at that time but Mm -hmm. it's where there and some authors some some experts will place the roots of the movement in the abolitionist movement so there are a couple of newer books out on pan-africanism that i think are really interesting Mm -hmm. um one uh is by is um pan-africanism a history and it's by Hakeem Adi. So um, Hakeem Adi. Mm-hmm. That one is a. I find it to be very accessible in terms of uh, 
the reading and the way it flows. But I D outlines how Pan Africanism was really taking coherence, really took coherence, developed coherence as a movement with abolitionism. So people um, in both on the on the continent in Europe and in the United States and in the British North American colonies, talking about um, um, and 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 getting together, banding together to 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 work toward African people's freedom, their liberation, and then um, you know to eliminate racism, mm -hmm. working to to am ameliorate the conditions that African people were finding themselves in. Um, but in terms of Pan-Africanism uh, as, as a very, very coherent set of ideas and an ideology that people start to organize around very consciously, a lot of people put that, um, that in the, um, or, or track that back to, trace it back to 1900 when the first Pan-African conference was started um, by Henry Sylvester Williams. So um, uh, depending on where you look, you're gonna get some different answers as to the origins. But I hope that wasn't confusing, I was just giving. No, 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 it makes sense because in my head, I always link those two, but then I, I'm actually um, slowly working myself through um, Ida B. Wells, A Sword Among Lions. Mm -hmm. And um, that's Paula Giddens work about Ida B. Wells and um, which I wish was on an audio book, but that's a whole <laughs> other thing that I don't understand why this amazing work is not an audio book. So um, as she's talking and going through that history, then I'm seeing like, OK, there are these roots of Pan-Africanism that are there, too, in some of the journalists talking about it. So I know it started before Garvey, but I think it's interesting because in my mind, I'm connecting it with that. And I see um, Chinzira made a comment. She was like, she loves your comment of Pan-Africanism was born in the whole of the slave ship. I think that that's important because one of the comments I hear people make all the time is, and you and I have talked about this, is so there's this idea that like African people were selling each other and I'm like, no, they weren't selling each other. They were selling their enemies. They didn't have a sense of Pan-Africanism. They didn't have a collective identity. These were different ethnic groups. And that's kind of the interesting thing is you got all these different ethnic groups and then slavers understood that. That's why they would have people in different ethnic groups on the ships so they couldn't communicate with each other. But then, like you said, Michael Gomez talks about that transformation of like in the whole of slave ship, you looking around and everybody, you know, at least phenotypically in some way looks like you and you recognize we're all in the same situation. So we've got to be able to do something so that there's this transformation that's taking place from different ethnic groups to we need to be this collective to work together. Right. Yes. And um I like to talk to students about that concept too. So some students will, you know, of course with teaching, sometimes people think, oh, it's teaching history and you just teach the history and that's it. And of course, I think now with the um, whole mess <laughs> that's coming up about and around critical race theory or what people are labeling critical race theory, um, and a lot of it is Are you just teaching critical race theory in your classes? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I do not teach critical race theory. I don't use that methodology. Um, and, and it's not that it's not a good methodology, an important methodology. It's just, it's really specific. And that's not, I didn't have Law training school. in critical. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so, but they're aiming um, uh, uh, the ire, the anger at his history, right? And, mm. and, and some of the 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 really what I think are important perspectives that uh, African um, people are bringing to the study of U.S. history. So I said all that to say, obviously, there is a lot of emotion around history, mm -hmm. even though 
it's been treated like just the facts, just the facts and only the facts in the past. So good um, instructors, good teachers who know their craft know that they have to deal with emotions in the classroom. So when, of course, we talk about West African, Central Africa before for the 1400s and then mm -hmm. after, during and after, I, you know, I let students express their emotions and inevitably somebody said, I'm frustrated because we sold each other. I'm frustrated because Africans sold us and we have to break that conversation down. And that is a good point to talk about how this idea of um, uh, we are one people, right? We have a common ancestry, a common history and a common uh, uh, struggles develops over time. And it develops in the diaspora. It's not a, it, it's not there on the continent. That is like a kind of yeah. I think the making of the diaspora develops this making uh, this, this develops pan-africanism. But mm -hmm. there is so the other book that um I uh suggest is um a handbook of pan-africanism by Rayland. Mm -hmm. It's edited by Rayland Rabaka. So it's R E L A N D R A B A K. Okay. A handbook of Pan Africanism. Okay, got it. Um, it's you know it's not Pan Africanism one hundred and one. Uh, uh, Hakim Adi developed Pan Africanism a history for teaching survey courses, general survey courses. So the book is very accessible to beginners. We want to know more about Pan-Africanism. Rabaka's edited volume is more for advanced conversations about Pan-Africanism. And I brought that up to say one particular chapter in Rabaka's work claims that Pan-Africanism, don't, don't be too quick to say Pan-Africanism didn't develop in West Africa because some of the first abolitionists were actually West Africans and then goes into the, that um, particular, to, to, to defend his, his point. So this is very interesting. Um, uh, there's so much more to know about Pan-Africanism. And initially I felt bad, like, okay, I've done this whole dissertation on Pan-African, Pan-African cultural nationalism. And there's so many questions I cannot answer about Pan-Africanism. But after reading the handbook of Pan-Africanism, I, and um, Pan-Africanism of history, I developed a really, really understanding of how vast Pan-Africanism is and how much there still is to know about it. Interesting. Yeah, because even when we're talking about uh, the development of a West African uh identity mm -hmm. um uh that happens among people on the continent from the continent and i did it didn't even cross my mind that this actually takes people developing you know saying hey wait we're we're kind of we're co we we cohere in these ways we're similar in these ways and let's meet and caucus and talk about it and think about what we're going to do in terms mm -hmm. of working together for our sovereignty, right? That kind of thing. And, and it's, you know, a lot of it is around anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, uh, a lot of the work that they do, but the, the issues of identity and who is, who is, who's a part of Pan-Africa, right? <laughs> who's a part of a unified Africa and who's not really comes up over and over and over again. You know, um, and in particular, mm -hmm. this concept of Pan-Africanism is in, in terms of the com Congresses and the conferences, it is really, really centered in the diaspora initially. But in terms of when you make, when you set the definition for Pan-Africanism and you look and say, okay, well, abolitionism, there's a strain of Pan-Africanism that's expressed as abolitionism. And so prior to 1900, there are many, many people in West Africa who are doing the work of saying, you know, of saying, um, hey, we need to, we need to work together for the freedom of all our people and who go back and forth, you know, they are born in 
um, Sierra Leone, and then they travel to the United States where they they get education and they work with African Americans and they go back and forth. You know, there's that. But yes, I don't want to blow off the fact that when you talk about the conferences, when you're talking about the congresses, initially there's a whole phase from 1900 to 1945 where they're all centered in the diaspora and really centered diasporic thinkers and diasporic activists, whether the person is from Trinidad or whether the person is um, W.E.B. Du Bois from Massachusetts or whether it's Garvey from Jamaica. Um, George Padmore. Padmore, you know, like I said before, mm -hmm. Williams, um, mm -hmm. the uh, Amy Ashwood Garvey, who's um, very uh, supportive of the fifth pan uh, development of the fifth pan African Congress, and she's Jamaican. Um, mm -hmm. So many people. There, there's a host of, of 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 activists that Adi, both Adi and the authors in Rebecca's book, introduce us to. You just actually made me think, and this might be a stretch. It, um, in Zinga, Queen in Zinga. Mm -hmm. um, could she be considered a Pan-Africanist? An early an early thinker in Pan-Africanism just in terms of her being against enslavement and fighting the Portuguese. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of complex, but um, <laughs> I mean, I know, know. first of all, Huh, you know, the, no, I'm just saying. I know, like Angolan history is not your 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 thing, but when you said that, I was just thinking. I mean, because she was pretty darn adamant about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think um, if we if there needs to be more work on, or I need to read more work, I might be ignorant to what's out there. But um, in terms of what's already been writ written, but I really think there's more work that I need to discover or that needs to be done on abolitionism as an expression of Pan-Africanism. Because what I've been reading about Pan-Africanism, honestly, prior to these two books really does start in 1900. Got it, okay. Yeah, it really does with, with the first Pan-African conference. Got it. I mean, I was just thinking about it in I don't remember if it's Michael Gomez's book or it might be Jason Young's book. Um, he might be somebody's talking about it. Don't give me the lying. Um, they're they're talking about Nzinga and her being very much with the kind of the Catholic identity and the Portuguese identity, and then her making this dramatic shift. And she's like, period, point blank, you're not taking anybody, you're not taking my people, nobody else <laughs> up out of here and enslaving nobody. Um, and so I'm like, okay, so this is early on, and she's she's got these ideas about abolitionism um yeah. so yeah and let's let's say let's say proto-pan-africanist maybe she's a proto-pan-africanist it's not you know it's not being called pan-africanism at the time mm -hmm. and there's no conference or congress or caucus or whatever but her the the thinking you know her transformation is certainly a part of the early formation of this idea that we're not we cannot operate and live in these silos mm -hmm. you know i'm this ethnicity or i'm you know the queen of this nation and i would look out for only the the upper and middle class of this nation or you know mm -hmm. if you could say that you know mm -hmm. um the, the the privileged classes the royalty whatever uh but that we we have to think beyond that and that's mm -hmm. definitely wherever people are thinking beyond the 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 kind of um you know ethnicities and religious uh uh enclaves and i hope that's not too negative of a word i want to be more neutral but you know those categories um and saying we have a common struggle mm -hmm. then that's at least pro proto pan africanism yeah, Pro, yeah i like that proto pan africanism so maybe <laughs> we can come up with a list of people that are proto pan africanism <laughs> Right. Perhaps Queen Nzinga is in, in that list. Um, yeah, but you threw me for a loop because I thought you were talking about Queen Nzinga, Queen Nzinga, right? To be Oh, no. Right? I'm sorry. And I was like, yes, yes, of course. You know. <laughs> no, it's just when you said that, I hadn't thought about that. And as I was listening to you, and I was like, huh, because she fit in this category. So, um, my bad with that. But that actually made me think of another thing 
in terms of um, what would you say? And we, we've got like maybe 15 more minutes. What do you what are the pitfalls when you think about the history? And and I heard an early thing of Garvey kicking folk out because <laughs> he didn't like their popularity. But what would you say, like, as you just look back, like uh, some of the lessons learned? Yeah, well, so, I mean, one of, well, we know when we talk about Marcus Garvey, we, a lot, a lot, lot of us love and respect Garvey and what he did. Nobody, I cannot imagine, like, he was 28 when he got started with the UNIA, I think. I Like, I can't believe, I can't imagine being that together at 28, right? <laughs> and mm. then, then having this global movement, sparking this global movement that attracts millions of people to do the work of pan-Africanism. I just can't imagine. So, but in, when we talk about pitfalls, then, you know, we know one of the recurring criticisms of Garvey is that he tried to do it all and position himself to be the, 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 the king of everything. And um, we know that we don't all have all the knowledge and all the expertise, I guess, which links back to you <laughs> talking about my common criticism of people who are not historians who are like, I'm a historian because, you know, this, that, or the third thing. We all have our expertise. And you don't, and I'm not saying that you have to be formally educated to have expertise. I'm right. just saying that not one person knows everything, not one right. person can do everything. And so we need to remember to that everybody has value, everybody's um, knowledge. Um, uh, they can, everybody can bring knowledge and experience to the table and we have to respect that, whether it's um, men, women, um, members of the LBGTQ community, um, uh, whether they're intellectuals, whether they're working class or poor people, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody has something to bring to the table. Right. And um, it wasn't just Garvey, right? It was Garvey and Du Bois, we know that 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 rivalry right wasn't in the unia and the naacp um it was elites and the intelligentsia right leading the 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 aspects of the movement um and not 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 incorporating working class people's needs and visions and values and leadership drawing on their leadership mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and um so that's important right be inclusive um uh develop everybody's you know uh leadership potential develop everybody's uh um potential to become their best person mm -hmm. um in in their making their contributions so those are those are some of the 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 pitfalls there are some uh, larger ones i think i've touched on it which is and you did too which is a lot of the early work of Pan-Africanism as a movement, if we're talking about from 1900 to 1945, was very centered in the in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And it took um, the, I think the Manchester Congress in 1945, Manchester England Conference was the turning point. And people had, who participated and who planned it had a vision to take pan-africanism home as they called it and so um the sixth that was the fifth pan-african congress if i didn't say that already so the sixth what they call the six pack the six pac um was in tanzania and that 1945 represents um, a time when pan-africanism became centered and rooted on the african continent and uh, that uh, you know, a time when it was able to focus on African issues, you know, continental African issues, not diasporic mm -hmm. as much, you know, totally center on diasporic African um, issues. But even once that happened, I think we had to under, we have to understand that there still has to be a balance. So it can't be overly focused on the continent. It can't be overly focused on um, the diaspora. It can't be overly focused on intellectuals over workers. It can't be overly focused on workers over intellectuals. You can't just kick all the intellectuals out. Um, uh, and then there's the, 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 the way it consolidated 
itself, say for instance, through the formation of the African Union, right? The organization of African unity and then mm -hmm. the formation of the African unity. How then does Pan-Africanism exist on a, a, an institutional level, um, in particular on an international level mm -hmm. um, and still include the grassroots? Mm -hmm. I think there's still issues that need to be worked out in those ways. Some of the things that I was thinking of, because, you know, as a psychologist, I'm going to think about it from a particular perspective. And I see Chinzir is kind of making a comment. <laughs> she made a comment is, you know, it's a shame that the brothers was moving on, <laughs> on, on the sisters and leadership is, I mean, I think, you know, kind of following that cult of personality, because that you can have those leaders that have, um, the charismatic leader that is problem problematic and we've seen that um, over time in history and just kind of following a person and a personality as opposed to being clear about the ideas the conflicts that have happened and particularly during that time i think that there were women in leadership but then at the same time there were women that pushed out of leadership positions um so i think we can't discount the sexism um that has historically been in, in those situations. And then I heard, then I was, and again, I've been reading so many books that I don't remember what this one came from because I'm not a historian, so I don't try to keep this stuff in my head like that. And one of the things that I um, was reading about the, um, the there, there being a controversy with um, Marcus Garvey and his first and the second wife, like, there being some kind of overlap. Have you read anything about that? Um, I'd say definitely, again, check out Keisha Blaine and Natanya Duncan's work. Um, mm -hmm. They both deal with both Amy Ashwood Garvey, the mm -hmm. first, um, Garvey's first wife, um, and that short-lived marriage. And then Amy Jakes Garvey, Garvey's second wife, the mother of his two sons, um, the woman who carried on his legacy and published like philosophy and opinions and Garvey and Garveyism um, and their relationship. It's um, sometimes foggy mm -hmm. because uh, my understanding is they were compatriots within the UNIA. Mm -hmm. um, but then there were some issues that I remember reading about in Blaine's book between Amy Ashwood and Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. um, that made it sort of obvious why the relationship didn't last long. Mm -hmm. And um, she, I think, describes the two women as really different in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, a a Amy Ashwood, Garvey being very public, a very, very public mover and shaker, very talented um, and, and connected woman. And Amy Jakes Garvey also being talented and connected, but being more um, of behind a the behind scenes. the scenes worker. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at, you know, what people are writing about Garvey's personality, you can see how the second Amy would mesh more with Marcus Garvey than the first. And in terms of their relationship, the two women, um, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes one says something about their relationship that doesn't seem to comport with other things that mm -hmm. we find in the uh, in the uh, data in the literature. So, um, yeah, I would say definitely read those. And I forgot Eula Taylor. So Eula mm -hmm. Taylor's work, Keisha Blaine's work, Natanya Duncan's work to find out more about that because Eula Taylor did a whole of uh, the Veiled Garvey. I think a whole um, book on Amy Jakes Garvey. Okay. Yeah. And I just thought that was interesting because it was just like in passing, they were whatever I was um, listening to in the book, they were making that pointing out that Amy Jakes was like, I don't know if she was a secretary, she had some kind of administrative role. And then there were questions about overlap. Right. And then whatever, and all of it just thought this stuck in my head. I was like, oh, that's kind of one of the things that happens in movements too, is that like people not being clear and delineated about relationships and how relationships should develop. And, um, and then there ends up being problems. So it's just, you know, one of my thoughts. Um, I did want to address the mm -hmm. other issue of, um, 
I think maybe what Sister Chin Zero was talking about was when I was saying about uh, Autocore Kofi and how because of her, the notoriety, how um, she was expelled from the UNIA. At mm -hmm. least that's what the speculation is. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I do want to say, though, both Duncan and Blaine um, really make it clear that women did have a place and a role in the UNIA. Mm -hmm. So don't forget, it's the night. It's 1919. It's the 1920s, right? It's in the early 1930s, and the women um, in the UNIA had uh, a, they could vote. They had voting privileges, and so think about it. If women have voting privileges in the UNIA, this is what Natanya Duncan points out in one of her lectures. If women have voting privileges in the UNIA in 1919, that's prior to when women get the vote in the United States and in Britain. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely prior to when black women are enfranchised because you have to think most African-American women in 1920 were living in the South where African-Americans were still enfranchised, disenfranchised. So um, uh, for all intents and purposes, disenfranchised. So so women were able this is a nuanced point that queen and zinga Heru made about being a pan-african cultural nationalist in the 1970s the 1960s and 70s that um her her um her sister made about being a pan-africanist in the 1960s and 70s you have to understand that living in a sexist world these black nationalists spaces were not perfect but mm -hmm. were often more nurturing to them in terms of their leadership in terms of their um business skills in terms of the their organizing skills than any place that they found elsewhere so you have to kind of look at the unia as both a nurturing space for women's leadership and a space that was challenging a space where women also perpetuated patriarchal views about uh, activism and leadership. So it, it's it's real, you know, hard to navigate um, just in a in, in a simplistic way, in just a sentence or you know, two. The way I like to think of it is perfect imperfection. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was an oxymoron, right? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, and that's okay because I think that I mean that's what we're dealing with today. This was an amazing and enlightening conversation. I always like talking to you because you always like get me straight on the history stuff. So, thank you. Oh, thank you for having me, and and I really really appreciate this space um, and the chance to talk to you to get more views. I don't know if people had questions um, who were watching. But yeah, just, like Chen, Chen Zero, I know you got it. I know you got to stop. I don't know if you can answer this question. So she said, it "Was uh, Du Bois really a, a valid Pan Africanist?" <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Du Bois was. So, so we're not. Remember, we're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with beings, and they're actually the way uh, D lays out his book. There's a period. Um, that Du Bois dominates the Pan-Africanist movement. So if you look at who organized the Pan-African Congresses from like um, 1919 through the 1920s, it's Du Bois. Mm -hmm. um, it's Du Bois who is developing in concert with other people, resolutions that, will, that are to be presented um, it, on the world stage about um, black independence, about African independence, you know, about specific independence movements that are um, brewing. So, so yes, um, he is the one who wants to, he goes to Ghana and a part of why he goes to Ghana is to work um, in Ghana under Nkrumah's, you know, sort of um, vision within mm -hmm. Nkrumah's vision to make a, 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 a an academic, as people would call, sci say, scientifically developed Pan-Africanism sort of encyclopedia, encyclopedia of Pan-African knowledge, like what you need to know about this history, this culture, that's Pan-Africanism. 
So, um, yes, he's a very valid Pan-Africanist and a leader um, um, in the movement and, in, yeah. and a thought leader in terms of developing the ideology. And I think most people, the, the conversation becomes like, because he can have some controversial stuff, particularly in his early writings, but just like everybody, he develops over time. Right. Um, and so as you look at his writings, that's what you see is that time, that development over time. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McCray. She's an associate professor in history, and this year is a visiting professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. So hopefully we can have another conversation in the future. Absolutely. It was All great right. being here. Thank you so much. No problem. Take care. Bye.